Welcome to the Securing the Future event. This is designed to empower activists with the knowledge of decentralized technologies that will increase your privacy, enhance security. And this event is supported by our friends over at the Filecoin Foundation for the Decentralized Web. It's produced in partnership with our other friends at Funding the Commons. My name is Elon, and I'm going to be your event host today. For those of you who are new to TechSoup, we're a nonprofit that helps other nonprofits get and use technology. Um, so if you're looking for software discounts and donations, TechSoup's got your back. So we have got four guest experts here with us today. So we've got Lindsay Tullock from the Tor Project. We've got Martin Shelton from the Freedom of Press Foundation. We've got Holmes Wilson, who's going to talk about the Quiet app. And then we've got Thorin Klazowski from the Electronic Frontier Foundation, who will talk about some of their educational resources for activists and people like yourselves who are concerned about privacy and security. Lindsay's here to do the first demo of Snowflake, which is a tool from Tor that allows you to breeze past internet sensors with this free and open source tool. Lindsay is a privacy and security researcher and a senior software developer working on the anti-censorship team at the Tor project. And Lindsay's work on Locks, which is a privacy preserving reputation based bridge distribution system actually comes out of this research that's now being integrated into the Tor browser. And with that, I'm turning it over to Lindsay. Hello, I'm Lindsay at, uh, or Oni Miang, and um, I'm working on the anti-censorship team at the Tor project. So if you're not already working in this space, that description alone may not provide a very good picture of the kind of work that I actually do. So to give you a bit more context, my work on the anti-censorship team focuses on observing and thinking about how censors tend to censor the internet, what kind of trade-offs they're making by doing that, and then developing, testing, and deploying software that directly targets the weaknesses of censorship strategies in order to help users around the world access the open internet. I'm sure you have lots of questions about how one would actually go about doing this. So to give a more concrete example, let me tell you about one of our popular censorship circumvention tools, Snowflake, and how it helped Iranians circumvent censorship during the Masa Amini protests in Iran. So you might remember that in 2023, the death of a 22-year-old Iranian woman, Masa Amini, who was apparently targeted for not wearing her hijab properly, sparked widespread protests across Iran. As part of their attempt to quell the uprisings across the country, the Iranian government shut down the internet to prevent people from organizing and learning what was going on by blocking access to social media and international reporting, among other things. Many Iranian internet users turned to the Tor project to regain access to the open internet for important information about the ongoing protests, but in regions where the internet is heavily censored, it's not as simple as just use Tor. Tor itself was designed to provide truly private internet browsing and anonymity to users. It does this by first looking at the set of volunteer-run Tor relays operating all over the world, charting a random path through three of those relays, and encrypting the request three times so that each node can only decrypt a single layer of encryption. This makes it impossible for any one node to link the original user to their destination. So while anonymity keeps users safe from surveillance and persecution for what they do online, the initial lookup of Tor relays that a Tor connection depends on is public, which makes these relays easy for a sensor to block. If we want to help users in censored regions access the internet, we have to come up with strategies that make the first hop in a Tor connection accessible to users despite this. Snowflake is one of the ways that we do this. The power of Snowflake lies in its ability to utilize a vast network of temporary peer-to-peer -peer proxies. It relies on peers like you, that are able to access the open internet running the Snowflake extension in a browser like Chrome or Firefox. This operates in the background while you browse and advertises itself to the Snowflake broker that then helps negotiate the connection between your proxy and a user in a censored region. As long as you keep your browser open, people can use your proxy as the first hop in a Tor connection that will give them access to the open internet. And if you close your browser, it's not a problem. The Snowflake pro protocol is designed to quickly and easily swap Snowflake proxies that are no longer connecting for new proxies that are. This is an effective censorship circumvention strategy because it's easy to use and very difficult for censors to block. 
effectively blocking Snowflake would require a sensor to know and block the IP address of every person running a Snowflake proxy. This would be extremely time consuming and resource intensive for a sensor. If they decide to cut corners and err on the side of overblocking, they're likely to block access to essential services that they rely on to keep things like businesses running smoothly. Since Snowflake proxies are assumed to be ephemeral or temporary, even if a sensor blocks some of the proxies, more proxies can easily be switched in to continue a user's connection. And the best part is running Snowflake is something easy that you can do right now to help fight censorship. All you need to do is open Firefox or Chrome on a laptop, install the Snowflake web extension from the Tor project and enable it. When it turns green, someone has connected to your proxy and you've helped them gain access to the open internet. And I can even show you my own Snowflake proxy that's been running throughout this presentation. And before that, I've helped three users in the past hours. So with that, I would like to encourage you all to install the Snowflake web extension and thank you for your attention. Next, we're going to pass it over to Martin Shelton from the Freedom of Press Foundation, who is going to do a demo of Signal, which is a security focused chat app. Martin is the principal researcher at the Freedom of the Press Foundation, conducting research with journalists on their online safety. Martin facilitates digital training security or tr security trainings and leads the organization's editorial work. As a UX researcher, he previously worked with Google Chrome and the Coral Project at the New York Times, where he learned from journalists and at-risk groups about their security concerns. Martin's gonna talk about why most chat tools are problematic for privacy and how they can be exploited and why Signal can't be exploited in the same easy ways. So I'm today gonna to talk a little bit about chatting more safely with Signal. A uh, little bit about myself. So I'm Martin, I'm the principal researcher at Freedom of the Press Foundation. I work on a digital security training team and we do some consulting and uh, and trainings of various levels of sophistication. We also write uh, digital security guides, including some on Signal. Uh, gonna dive a little bit uh, deep on Signal today, but if you're interested in learning about these topics more broadly, uh, subscribe to our newsletter. That's at fpf.training slash subscribe. Let's start with Signal. Oop. Skip. <laughs> Skip the slide. All right. What? are we actually trying to solve for? Most messaging services that you're likely to use, maybe this is using text messages with your cell phone provider, or maybe it's Twitter DMs. Most of the messages that we're going to send over the internet probably are going to be intercepted by a service provider that can then read them. And this introduces risk to our private communications. So this could include risks like the risk of a data breach. If the company experiences a data breach, maybe your messages are scooped up in that data breach. And now those messages are leaked to a, an unwanted third party. But another type of unwanted third party could be somebody like uh, somebody who belongs to a three-letter agency or law enforcement agency. So this includes issues like surveillance and legal requests for your user data. Enter Signal, Hawaii Signal. This helps address some of this problem because it's end-to-end -end encrypted, meaning that only you and the people who you're speaking to are able to read the messages in conversation. This is free and open source, meaning that anybody is able to look at the code. And in fact, there's a long history of security researchers looking at this code, trying to make sure that it, it doesn't have any vulnerabilities. So it's upholding its promises, as you might hope. And then it's also funded by donations and not by selling your personal data. Always good news. It also minimizes data retention. What do I mean by that? Let me show you something. So you don't have to take my word for this. You can actually go to signal.org slash big brother. And what you're gonna see there is some grand jury subpoenas that Signal has received over the years requesting user data. And what they have to provide is the last connection date and account creation time. So that's pretty good. Like you're not going to be seeing a bunch of messages coming out of this in legal requests. So what does that look like? It's going to look like a pretty standard messaging app. Here we've got your landing page. If you click this little pencil icon at the bottom, you can start a new, me new message. You can send that to a new group. You can look somebody up by a username. You can look them up by a phone number. But let's say that I want to talk to my friend Moxie here. I click on them. 
can send a little message at the bottom. This is all going to look very familiar. Hey. And another thing that you can do is you can go into this, this the top right corner. You can send a call, video call, or voice. You can also go into the options for this particular user. I'm going to go into disappearing messages for this user. So you can change this between 30 seconds and four weeks if you want, or a custom time of your choice. And that's pretty much it. It's pretty straightforward. It's going to feel a lot like other messaging apps that you probably used already. And this is one thing that actually makes it really great for the journalists with whom we work, because sometimes they're in a hurry, don't really want to pick up new things all the time. But let's say that you are an activist. Some things that you might want to consider enabling disappearing messages, as we just showed, hiding notifications on lock screens, uh, using a username. And you don't have to use a phone number on Signal if you don't want to, to as an identifier. You can now use a username. The way to set that up is you go to this little profile icon at the top left. You click into that, and then you're going to see a profile uh, selector at the top. And then from there, you can go into your username settings. A few caveats to consider. Uh, by default, the phone number is the identifier. So you really do want to set up that username if you're going to be giving away uh, your signal information to somebody. You really want to trust who you're talking to. Uh, and then encryption can only protect you against the service provider. It doesn't protect you against the other people who you're speaking to. So be aware of what you're saying in big group chats. Uh, and then if your device is ever uh, lost or seized, you really want to use a strong passcode. We have a couple of guides on how to do all of this. If you're just getting started, check out our guide to Signal for Beginners. And then if you're really getting in the weeds on this, uh, go check in, go check out our guide on locking down Signal. And the, pl the place that you can find information about us, uh, martin at freedom.press. Uh, our entire team is available at training at freedom.press if you want to learn more. And then also check out our guides and training. You can see those signal guides at freedom.press slash training. And second plug for the newsletter, fpf.training slash subscribe. Thanks. Our third demo is of Quiet. Quiet's an app that is a slackier signal for teams doing sensitive work who need the security of signal, but also those team organizing features of something like Slack. Holmes Wilson is an activist and technologist, and in 2011, he co-founded the Tech Policy Activism Organization, Fight for the Future, which works to defend privacy, political organizing, and creative expression. Now he's building Quiet, Holmes is going to demo Quiet's work so far, show some slides of what they've been building, and invite everyone interested in giving feedback because he's trying to build a tool that's useful to you. So with that, let's pass it over to Holmes. So I'm Holmes. I am like a former nonprofit founder. And right now I'm working on building a Slackier signal for journalists and activists where teams control their own data without having to run their own server or trust someone else's. So what do I mean by a Slackier signal and why do we think we need one? So Quiet started with research into the security needs of activists and journalists. We also spoke to security advisors who advise activists and journalists. The needs that surfaced were the ones you've heard about already, things like end-to-end -end encryption and disappearing messages, also resistance to account credential phishing, and of course, usability <clears throat> was above all the most important requirement because when security tools get in the way of activists, uh, or journalists doing their work, the work will come first and people will use less secure tools. But next week, we narrowed down our research a bit and focused on workplaces and online communities. And there we found some more needs. So people needed the encryption and disappearing messages of Signal, but they also needed features that Slack had, things like the notion of a team, roles within the team, channels for organizing different types of team communication, threads for organizing conversations within a channel, and, and of course, like message history. So we saw this gap where people needed something between Slack and Signal, and they didn't really have something that fit, that fit them and were caught between two tools. So we've been working very closely with a few design partners. We're building quiet and close communication with a US-based abortion fund, a Russian language news organization, a volunteer-run climate activism group. And while quiet is not ready for these groups yet to use day to day, we can still design quiet with them in the meantime and tailor what we're doing, what we're building to their needs. And I'm always looking for more groups to talk to. It's one of my favorite things about this work. 
So I'm going to give a quick demo of Quiet. Here we are. So I have two Quiets next to each other on the screen here. They, I will send a message from this one. The other, I will send an emoji. And, and this is just super basic right now, but the interesting and exciting thing about Quiet is that it is decentralized. These two apps, which could be on different people's computers too, are communicating without a central server over the Tor network, which you've heard a little bit about already. That, I'll keep the demo super brief for time, but I'm happy to give a longer demo to anyone who's interested. And we still have a ton of work to do, obviously. Right now we're working on iOS notifications that will be supported by an optional server. Next would come DMs and private channels and features for privacy within a particular community, followed by or work on disappearing messages. We've noted that communities don't just need disappearing messages. They want admin control over disappearing messages for a space. They can set policies that everyone's comfortable with, make sure those policies are followed organization-wide. And then they just need a lot of features that would be familiar in any messaging app for basic collaboration and expression, things like reactions, threads, dark mode, and stuff like that. There are a few advantages to being decentralized. We don't have to collect any data. You don't have to enter an email or phone number to use Quiet. We don't have to worry about server breaches because if you're using Quiet without a server, there is no server. There's no arbitrary limits on file sizes or on message history. We can protect metadata a lot better than centralized tools, not just against subpoenas, but even against like ourselves having access or the capability to potentially access that data. And Quiet someday will even work in internet outages. For example, on a local Wi-Fi network, if the internet goes out or if you're in a shutdown scenario, you'd be able to keep using it for collaboration. Finally, Decentralized approaches, approaches can let us be more sustainable than centralized ones. Signal costs a huge amount of money to keep running every year. It's about to get to the point where they're spending 50 million a year running it, which as anyone here who <laughs> runs a nonprofit knows that's, that's a huge fundraising lift and there is a sustainability issue uh, there and not every organization will be able to do that. With decentralization, we can collect less user data, but provide more features as part of a free app. And our business model is to be open source forever to never charge for privacy features and to offer subscription plans around features that uh, require a server, things like a group video calls, and those would be optional. There's some, some people might be curious about how we use Tor and why. The main reason is just that it provides a known and established layer of end-to-end -end encryption with some metadata protection. So it protects not just what you're saying, but also who you're saying it to or from being known to others. And it also simplifies peer discovery across different network settings, and while Tor can be slow to connect right now, it's always improving. And it's a, a known established project that will improve, continue to improve about us. That is it. And I would just say that if you need a Slack your signal or know someone who does, I, I would love to talk with you. So please do reach out. Is, is Thorin Klazowski from the EFF who's going to talk about the surveillance self-defense kit. So Thorin is a security and privacy activist at the EFF where he focuses on providing practical advice to protecting online security, including handling things like the Surveillance Self-Defense Project. Before joining EFF, Thorin covered privacy and security for Wirecutter and the New York Times, providing he, where he wrote the bulk of the Wirecutter's security how-tos, explainers, and guides. Um, the EFF is a nonprofit that's been dedicated to securing digital rights for over 30 years, and amongst those projects, they have been building these great guides and explainers to help people protect themselves online. My name is Thorin Kozowski. I'm a security and privacy activist at EFF. I think the easiest kind of shorthand to understand a lot of the work I do is that I am the weirdo who opens up the settings app, settings in every single app I download or product I buy, and then start poking around in it, which is essentially what uh, a lot of our surveillance self-defense resource is. It's a repository of how-to guides and explainers that help people navigate the privacy and security issues they face. Uh, it details a lot of the tools we talked about today from kind of various degrees of comfort level. For example, we have a guide to installing and using the Tor browser, and then more detailed guides with a step-by-step for using Signal. SSD is 15 years old and has received hundreds of updates in that time. It's a very rare resource on the internet, along with a lot of what Martin and FPF do. As one of my colleagues like to say, the internet is a graveyard of outdated security advice. And so we work tirelessly to keep our guides updated and accurate, which means they're reviewed by, reviewed and written by not just me, but also technologists and lawyers. They're also translated into a number of languages, including Arabic, French, Spanish, Portuguese, Turkish, and Russian, among others. 
So to give you an idea how the, all this works, you can head over to ssd.eff.org if you want to just follow along on your own, or I'll give the tour here. So as you can see, we divide everything up into four basic sections, depending on what your comfort level is with a lot of these types of tools. It's basics, tool guides, and further learning. And then we also have security scenarios, which I'll get to in a minute. Basics are, as you'd expect, a sort of starter guide for learning the fundamentals of online security and pri privacy. We have several animated video guides, as well as a bunch of text. So depending on what you prefer, how you prefer to learn, we have different options there. I think the one of the big ones that we have is our security plan, which sort of teaches people the concepts of what a lot of security researchers call threat modeling. We like security plan a little bit more because it's far less intimidating, but it teaches you the core ideas of being secure online without recommending specific tools. It allows you to decide what you're going to need to do because we can't do it. We all can't do everything all of the time. And that's one of the core fundamentals of SSD is to empower our readers to make their choices. And part of that is accepting that no one single person's security situation is the same. So a journalist who is reporting in Gaza needs a different tool and security practices than a protester in the United States. And a person who is shopping online needs different practices than either of them. So instead of telling people to specifically use X, Y, and Z, we try to offer a framework for people to learn how to use these skills on their own. Uh, and then we also have tool guides. So like Martin's signal guides, we have one on signal also. It is very long <laughs> and has a lot of entry points depending on what you need and just really walks you through the basics of installing something if you've never used a tool like this before, all the way to setting up much deeper settings. We also have one for Tor. Same kind of thing. If you've never installed software on your computer, we start there. So walks you through no matter what your comfort levels are and then starts digging deeper and deeper as you go. Finally, we have further learning, which is where we do a lot of our more detailed information about all sorts of topics. It's a catch-all for a bunch of different security scenarios also. So attending a protest is a very long guide that goes through a lot of the things you need to consider with digital security if you're attending a protest in the modern age. We also have details on mobile phone like just all of the sensors and different things in your phones. And the idea with these is that we want to provide people with technologist backed information on how the stuff we use actually works and what actually works for your privacy without trying to have too much misinformation that comes with a lot of this sort of stuff. Finally, we also have security scenarios, which is a place for kind of a, a starter pack for people who are who are landing on the site for the first time and maybe they don't know where to start. There's over 40 guides in SSD. Most people aren't going to spend their time reading all of them. Uh, this offers a way for people to see the six, in this case, six options that they can look at and they can get to what they need to know right now without reading a uh, novella of um, privacy and security advice. Um, so yeah, that's the basic rundown of SSD. Like I said, uh, we update it frequently. Um, I've gotten to about 70% of our guides this year alone. Um, we have a few more complicated stragglers left, but uh, yeah, that's it. Now we're going to get to the real heart of this, which is the Q&A section. Loads of good questions have been coming in through the chat. And I'm going to start off with some of those, which means for the rest of you, you've just bought yourself some time to add a couple more questions into the chat while we go through these initial questions. Let's start off with a big high-level question. I'm going to direct that to Holmes, which is basically, why do you think decentralization matters so much for nonprofits who are using technology? Yeah, so speaking from my perspective as someone who's run nonprofits of in the 8 to 10 person size range, there are two things that are tough about relying on big for-profits for your tech. One is that those companies often don't align with your values. So you're just like using stuff and like we would sometimes be using Google tools and running a campaign against Google and you feel silly about that. But a more important one is that sometimes those tools aren't really tailored to your needs. And one of those ways could be privacy. We've heard uh, about some privacy protecting tools and tools like Slack just really don't do a lot of the things that nonprofits would need to protect privacy, even though a lot of nonprofits rely on them. But, and so the thing I think where decentralization comes in is there are all these open source tools and there's a long history of that but you had to host them yourself. You had to set up your own infrastructure or you had to pay someone else to do it for you, in which case you gave up a lot of the privacy protections that they brought. And that really needs to change. And I think decentralization is the key because if we figure out how to build tools that are decentralized, 
those tools are just work out of the box for nonprofits. And you'll be able to take advantage of work happening in the open source ecosystem. Use that in your organization, not be depending on companies that you're not values aligned with that aren't really great for your privacy and security. And, but you won't have to set up all the server infrastructure and maintain it yourself in-house, which is usually out of reach cost-wise for nonprofits. Yeah, so it's really interesting. So you get to basically go into this new world where there is like data doesn't live on someone else's server. It lives in, in your own network of users. Exactly. So I've got a question for Thorin, which is what's the one thing that everyone should do to protect their data online? Yeah, I think one of the core recommendations that I usually give in SSD in general is to use unique passwords everywhere you can, especially on organization level. But I think that's going to set you with the kind of framework to start doing everything else. Smart. And so that would be, yes, these password tools that basically generate lots of fake passwords. What about this fancy new pass key stuff? Is that, do you think it's ready for prime time or is it a little too soon? It's funny, I think Martin and I have both looked at this. They're in, I, it depends on the site, I would say. Sometimes it is ready for prime time and other times it is absolutely not. It's, but there's no harm in trying them and they are definitely easier to use when they work correctly. <laughs> yes, always the caveat of if it works correctly. I'm going to throw a question now at Lindsay. You talked today about Snowflake, but what else could an everyday internet user do to support Tor's anti-censorship work? Yeah, thanks for the question. Snowflake is great because by simply using the Snowflake extension, users can donate bandwidth to Tor and by extension help users fight censorship. If you're a tech-savvy person, there are additional tools you can volunteer to run, and I will drop a link in the chat to those, like Tor Bridges or Web Tunnel Bridges. But these are a bit more complicated to set up. We're very happy if you're able to spare the bandwidth figuratively and literally to, to set one of those up. But it's also always great to get donations. Anti-censorship work is expensive and the strategies that censors employ vary a lot between regions and change quickly and constantly as technology evolves. So to stay on top of all of this and continue offering effective tools for circumvention, we need to develop new strategies and tools, also monitor and measure internet connectivity across regions and lean on our community team to investigate reports and feedback. And all this is expensive. So even like a $5 monthly individual donation, the cost of a VPN subscription can go a long way to helping fund our anti-censorship efforts. Awesome. Thank you. I actually have a follow-up question here from Pat about LastPass. And which is our password managers like LastPass trustworthy? Because once again, we're centralizing at some level. What do we, and obviously LastPass specifically has had a bit of their own breaches in the past. Is, is, is it just a better than the options, which is even worse? So what, how do we think around about that? Who wants to tackle that question? I can. I could. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say Martin or I probably make the most sense. Um, Martin, if you want to go ahead. Sure, yeah. Um, and, and we do get this question a lot. It's, uh, it's the, the framing that I'm often um, hearing is, isn't this like putting all your eggs in one basket? And I totally hear where people are coming from on that. But also those types of breaches are extremely rare. And even then, you still have a lot of time to respond. This is something that it really doesn't happen almost ever. Now, or where a password manager is experiencing a breach that leads to people's passwords being decrypted. Something like a one password, a dash lane, a there's Bitwarden. There's a lot of really strong password managers out there that are already doing a lot of work in order to make it really difficult for somebody to be able to decrypt any of your passwords because they would first have to get access to the email that you use to register that password. So they have to break in your email. Then they have to get the password database, which will be on your device. That's, those are the only places where that's uh, going to be stored in a way that's legible by default. Now, it's also true that the service provider, all right, like that in some ways is, can be very centralized. And so what that means is that you are dealing, like you do have to place a little bit of trust in them, make sure that they are doing their due diligence to make sure that when they say that you are getting a, this password manager that is encrypted in such a way that even they can't read the data, 
that they're doing it the right way. So that's something that brings us to step number two is remembering it's like, what's the relative risk? When we are reusing passwords, there is a 100% chance <laughs> that you are going to get, get into hot water because password reuse means that if somebody gets one of your passwords just one time, then they can try it out on lots of different websites. That's something that uh, you can really minimize that risk with the password manager. That's why we always say, absolutely go with the password manager. The one that I use is called 1Password. If you are living in the journalism world, they have, those are available for free under the 1Password for journalism program. But there's also a lot of different types of tools out there. Don't be married to anyone. I would say that Bitwarden is also a really great option for somebody who is just getting started and it's free by, by default. But that's really helpful to really have that insight, which is we can't, we're not going for perfection. We're about minimizing risk. And it sounds like Thorin just added a great link into the chat as well with their own guide around password manager selection, guiding you through some of this selection. Here's another question I've got here. Um, and this one's for Holmes, which is, there has been in the chat this feel back and forth around this comparison of like, look, how does Quiet compare with things like with Matrix, with Mattermost, with with Simple X? There's a whole bunch of other options there, and I don't think you'd have time to go deep into the nitty gritty of all of those. But high level, where, can you just talk about your positioning of what is the secret sauce that that makes Quiet unique from these other solutions? Yeah. So the first thing is that at a product level, we're focused on teams, like workplace teams or online communities. So folks who, if they didn't really need to worry about encryption or message deletion, would be pretty comfortable in Slack or in Discord. That's what we're, that's what we're focused on. And that narrows things down quite a bit. I think Simplex, at least in its current form, falls outside that, although maybe they have plans to go in that direction and they're an awesome project. I, I know the person building it too. And we talk sometimes. I think that once you narrow it down to team-based apps, there's Matrix, there's Mattermost, Wire, Rocket Chat. And an issue with a lot of these is that you, with Matrix and Rocket Chat, the issue is that you have to, there, there is end-to-end -end encryption. I believe Rocket Chat has it, but the account model is centered on the server. And so in order to have all of the security properties you'd want, you really want to be running your own server. Another example of that is in Matrix, you can only turn on disappearing messages currently if you control the server yourself, which is just like not acceptable for most groups. They don't want to run their own server, but they really need disappearing messages. Mattermost doesn't even have encryption. And there's another issue with posting it yourself where you have, um, where mobile apps do not work out of the box with a self-hosted option. You have to actually deploy your own mobile apps. The last I checked. There are, there are a few options that are close to what people need, but they're not quite a fit. And so we've talked to a lot of people who end up stuck where they try to cram their whole organization into signal. It ends up being a mess because there's a lot of people working there and you get split across a lot of channels or they stay in Slack and keep worrying about the day when all their messages might get breached by a phishing attack or by a server breach. Awesome. So my next question is aimed at Lindsay, and it comes from Becky, who says, will running Snowflake slow our in-house internet at all? Is that really a concern? Yeah, so it will use a little bit of your bandwidth with WebRTC, which is the same protocol that's running YouTube videos. And I, I don't know if it's Zoom, but anyway, it's like a video Skype or those kinds of things. I was running Snowflake through this whole conversation that we've been having, I, I've never noticed any slowdown on my internet and I don't think it, it would be noticeable. So yeah, so technically yes, but probably negligible. Yeah. Cool. So I've got a pair of questions now around Signal World. I'll start those at Martin, but others may want to jump in as well. And some of these, of course, were addressed in the chat, but not everyone has access to that chat. So I just want to make sure we get those out here into the spoken part as well. Can you sign up for Signal without a phone number right now? Is that a thing? No, you do need a phone number to access Signal. There are ways to work around that a little bit. Say if you wanted to sign up with a different Signal number, but then besides the one that's on your phone, you can totally do that with almost any phone number that you have access to. I've done it with 
with a landline number. I've done it with Google voice numbers. There's a lot of different ways to do this. And we have guides on that as well. If folks are interested, I can drop that in the chat. But you do need a phone number at first to bootstrap Signal. And so here's another related question. So if you're using Signal or any other kind of encrypted technology, does the person you're communicating with also need to be on Signal or some other encrypted platform for the encryption to work? Or can it just work one way? Can you be the secure one, but the other person isn't necessarily? Yeah. Um, so everybody who's in conversation needs to be using Signal. So this is, there's some really good reasons for this. The primary reason is that we have this very particular type of encryption. It needs to be able to talk to the other device using that same type of encryption. If we are making compromises around that, then we can't really guarantee the privacy properties as, as promised. But there's also, there's also a lot of different apps out there that have similar properties and that they have lots of different ways to leak your data. Say, for example, if you are using something like a WhatsApp, it uses uh, the same type of encryption as Signal underneath the hood. But the problem is a lot of people end up also, they might be inadvertently backing up some of their user data to something like iCloud or Google Drive. And if they're doing that, it's very possible that those third-party service providers have the plain text or like the human readable version of their messages. It's not ideal, but Signal... What Signal is doing is it has some really good reasoning behind it. So we need to be fully in that ecosystem of that app, that network to truly have this two-way encryption. So I've got a question here from Travis for Holmes, which is basically a question about like how hardcore is the privacy in Quiet? Does Quiet identify the members of the groups, the names of the channels, and does that all go into a central database in in, in quiet corp or what happens with all that yeah so right now the way it works is every community which would be like a workplace a workplace team or a an online community they have their own peer-to-peer -peer network that no one outside that community connects to or can connect to and within that network they join it with an invite link they've received securely from someone but within that network they can pick whatever name they want in that network and they can, and that name gets added to like the list of users in that network, but it's completely contained within the devices of the people who've been invited to that network. In the future for helping with iOS notifications, we are going to add a, a server, an optional server for that. There'll be two parts. One, the part that passes the notification, just an empty one that says, hey, wake up, which is what more or less how Signal works. And then another part that stores the data so that the iPhone receiving the notification can fetch it. In that case, um, all the information that the community has will be encrypted in a way that the server will not be able to see it. But, um, and people would also be able to optionally run their own server if they wanted to. But um, the server might know, for example, the iOS device ID of the person receiving a notification and might be able to learn some stuff about who's communicating with who if people do that optionally. But Quiet is very much based in user research. And our, in our research, we found that people really need reliable iOS apps in their teams. And we're making we are not, decentralization is something we're aspiring to and something we think is good, but it's not an ideological constraint that's going to make us make a bad product that we are letting users make that trade-off when they want to. Cool. Here's the big question. And it comes from Becky and I, and I actually want to throw it to everyone here for our experts, which is to say, Becky says, what's a good way to convince my not very tech savvy board that baking security and privacy into the way we work at our organization, it's worth the extra effort. Is the juice worth the squeeze? And, and how do I communicate that to, to my board member? Basically, Becky's here. Becky's drunk the Kool-Aid. Becky's in. But Becky needs to communicate that out to the rest of the world who may not be sold already. How do you start that conversation? Holmes, I'll give it to you first, and then I'll pass it on to Lindsay if you want to talk a little bit some about your experience there. I would just say quickly, just as someone who's run a nonprofit, and anything can happen when your stuff is insecure. And if there are any things that are important to your organization, it could be sensitive communications about HR. It could be the amount of money that you have sitting in your bank account. This is a thing. Sometimes nonprofits are able to get scammed or just or penetrated and, and robbed for whatever's in their account. Uh, that would be devastating, embarrassing, really powerful for relationships with donors. It's good to take information security seriously 
to the extent that's appropriate for your org. And if you're not thinking about it at all now as an org, it's good to start that conversation just that you don't get hit with some surprise calamity. Thank you. Lindsay, how do you have this conversation with the normies out there in the world? Yeah, I think that what Holmes said is really relevant to anyone that's thinking about going in this direction. I think also from like a censorship circumvention perspective, the more people that are running decentralized services or using Tor, the better anonymity everyone has and the more options, the more normalized it becomes. And yeah, I think that that's all I have for that. <laughs> yeah. Martin, in your world, you've been talking to journalists through your career. How do you start this conversation with them? How do you get them to start thinking like, oh, this isn't just more work to distract me from what I'm trying to get done, but actually fundamental to how they work. Yeah, no, there's a lot of, there's a lot of good examples out there of how to align some of the priorities that a journalist has with the different types of security practices that can be part of their work. Say, for example, we brought up password managers earlier. I don't type my password in twice anymore. I don't have typos in my password anymore. I press a button on my laptop and then it immediately fills out my entire password. This speeds along the work quite a lot. So there's a lot of different ways that this can actually be a big time saver. And this is just making me think about what are the different types of priorities that the people in your community have, and then how to start to talk about this in a way that really centralizes their, their needs. What are the different ways that they want to work? And then how do we start to talk about security tools and practices in a way that fits into their day-to-day? -day? And Thorne, you've really done a lot of writing for the general audience, New York Times and other places, people who aren't sweating security when they wake up in the middle of the night and say, oh my gosh, I'm not quite where I need to be with that. How do you, when you start at writing for a general audience, how do you bring the importance of this topic into the, into, into their, into the way they're thinking? Yeah, I think Holmes and Martin had already tapped into this a little bit, but just framing it around what uh, your organization or you personally need instead of going hard on downloading Tor and Signal instantly and going straight into one end of things, but looking at what your needs are and helping people get a, a better floor so they can look at the ceiling and know where that is instead of trying to jump straight through the ceiling to torture a metaphor there. But yes. that, That's interesting. Are there frameworks out there that can help an organization do that risk assessment? Like maybe you could sit down with your board and say, what are the kinds of information we deal with? Who are the audiences we deal with? What are the risks that potentially apply for our organization? I don't know. I was just thinking there's the Citizen Lab Security Planner, which might be a good resource for this, but I don't, it sounds like the EFF, the thing that you were introducing, Thorin, sounded like it could also fall into this category. I'm not sure. I'll share a link to the security planner though. I actually did. That reminded me that we do have a privacy guide for data minimization for nonprofits, which I will share here in today's space. We are coming towards the end of this event. Thank you all for joining us today, giving us an hour of your time. 